Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. I am Elizabeth Sackler, uh, the name up there. And, oh, that's not necessary, but thank you. I also have the great pleasure of being chair of this wonderful uh, museum. And uh, this is a very special occasion. So um, I'm delighted that you're here. And I'm also going to tell you that I'm going completely off script uh, because we have an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. And the last time it happened was eight years ago, uh, actually when the Sackler Center opened um, for the first time, opened its doors. Um, so I am, uh, before I go on to script, I'm gonna ask Arnold Lehman, our wonderful director, if he would kindly join me up here. Thank you. And Arnold, who, is, who has made this museum for Brooklyn all that it is, Brooklyn, is retiring this year. So uh, I'm delighted to have him here with me at this moment, and also delighted to um, ask Judy to join me on the stage. And the reason I would like her to join us is because the three of us haven't been together up here for a number of years. And I have some fireworks flowers for Judy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wanted to present you. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. You Thank welcome. you so much. Arnold, you, would you like to say a few uh, words before we embark on the program? Um, only that, what you're going to see this evening, um, with you all seated in nice, comfortable <laughs> seats, no rain, no threatening skies, no Judy Chicago screaming at the top of her lungs from the top of a lift, <laughs> um, no 10,000 people and kids gathering around in Prospect Park. Just think for a moment and put yourself in that place instead of being here um, so comfortably. And that would give you a better idea of what went on uh, the days ahead of that and that wonderful day. Um, so, without further ado... Um, You're turning it back to me so I can go back on script. Yes, without further ado, I'm giving this back to Elizabeth and her script, and I'm going off stage. <laughs> can I just say something? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that my lifelong dream of overcoming the erasure that the dinner party recounts was accomplished thanks to Elizabeth Sackler and Arnold Lehman. And it <laughs> and as we all agreed at dinner the other night celebrating Arnold's retirement, it will be really hard for anybody to fill his shoes. Hey, it's true. So thank you all for being here. Um, we are this evening um, going to be uh, watching Judy Chicago on fire. And for those of you who know Judy, you know she's always on fire. But in this particular time, we're going to be uh, looking at her pyrotechnic work, which was, uh, as Arnold had said, um, Butterfly for Brooklyn, which was extraordinary. And I could tell you a whole other bunch of anecdotes, but I think we want to thank Kate Amond, who is the editor, film editor, and the director of photography, Joan <laughs> Churchill is here. And I'm um, really delighted uh, that Glenn Adamson is with us this evening from the Museum of Art and Design to uh, run the panel after uh, after the screening, and I would like to um, thank um, the Dopkin Family Foundation because it was the Dop Dopkin Family Foundation that actually uh, made this incredible event possible and uh, the film that you're about to see. I would like to say that this thing sort of always begin, there's always an interesting backstory, I guess, and most people don't talk about it, but it sort of began out in... Um, 
New Mexico uh, with Judy and Barbara and I sitting around and talking about what might be a, a really fun thing to do. And uh, you're going to see it. And actually, uh, Judy did all the work and Barbara did all the work and I've just had the fun of introducing everybody and saying thank you very much to all of you for, for so much beauty and celebration of life and of art and of all things great. And I thank you, Judy, very much. So I'm going to read Glenn's, uh, Glenn Adamson's bio. Um, he is the Net Nanette Laidman Director of the Museum of uh, Arts and Design in New York City. Uh, he was, until autumn of 2013, head of research at the Victorian Albert, where he was active as curator, historian, and theorist. His publications include Thinking Through Craft in 2007, The Craft Reader, 2010, Invention of Craft, 2013, and Postmodern Style and Subversion, 1970 to 1990, which was published in 2011. He is also the co-founder and editor of the triannual Journal of Modern Craft. And now you know why he is the director of the Museum of Arts and Design. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Adamson, and thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Can I have another uh, warm round of applause for the three graces of Brooklyn that we just had on stage? That was absolutely extraordinary. And it, it's such an honor to be here uh, with you tonight, uh, to have traveled over from Manhattan to this great institution. I think always a very uh, special recognition when one museum invites the director of another museum to uh, be present at an event and it suggests that something important is happening. And certainly that is true tonight because we're having the extraordinary unveiling of this film. Uh, I'm not going to say much, but I do want to ask a question of the audience. How many of you were actually present for uh, The Butterfly for Brooklyn last year? Okay, and you, you're, you're now all dry, which is great to see. Um, and if you, if you were there, and indeed, if you weren't, you're about to learn it from this wonderful film, uh, you know that there was a divine intervention that made the eventual realization of this pyrotechnic sculptural work of genius of Judy Chicago is possible, and it looked like it might not happen, and then it did. And so somewhere up there, someone is smiling on the works of Judy Chicago, which is only as it should be. Uh, so what, what we are going to do uh, for the rest of this evening is first uh, watch this great film, and then we are going to be, or I am going to be joined on stage, of course, by Judy herself, also by Kate Amund, who was just mentioned, who was the lead editor for the film. Uh, and she'll talk a little bit as well about the team that brought the film into, uh, into existence. We'll also have with us uh, Chris Souza, who was one of the uh, main pyrotechnicians uh, that worked with Judy on, on the Butterfly for Brooklyn. And I think both, uh, we'll certainly talk about this, both the film and the pyrotechnics themselves were of course the work of many hands. And we will be recognizing the, the teams that brought these um, artistic gestures in, into being. And we'll also, I'm very happy to say, be joined by Donald Woodman, uh, who uh, is Judy's partner and an absolutely essential, um, an essential component uh, and, uh, and uh, agent of everything that happened on that magical day. And you'll also be introduced to him uh, in the film, and I think he actually has the best lines, if I remember rightly. Um, so at, at any rate, we'll, we'll be joined, joined by those, uh, those four folks on stage after the film. And with that, I will allow you to uh, sit back in your seats, settle in, and enjoy the show. So they're not going to start laying fireworks till Wednesday, is right. that it? That's what I understand. But the lines are on Everything in? is, the butterfly is laid out, the veins are laid in, and they can cut them at three foot intervals. How far from the edge of the image do the veins have to stop? Well, we can have a conversation with Chris. 
Hi. Hi. Sam is waiting to say hi to you because he loves a dinner party. <laughs> He's been to see us. Hello. We're here playing. We're setting up. You coming on Saturday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We're a whole bunch of people. Out, we're scouting out for different like, cool places to so watch it. Anywhere along here, all but the way around. They said that it would they be easy to watch from up, up high. high. So we're thinking of watching from over there. Can you yeah, all right. So pick your spot. Okay. We will. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Forward to it. Okay. In 2014, Judy Chicago celebrated her 75th birthday. Hi, Rusty. There were exhibitions and events around the country honoring Judy's 50-year career. The Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum presented the exhibition, Chicago in LA, Judy Chicago's early work, 1963 to 74. Judy was invited to present A Butterfly for Brooklyn, a fireworks piece in nearby Prospect Park. I waited 40 years to do this piece. Okay, so I it's at a level that I only dreamed of in 1974. I mean, the complexity and duration of this piece, the multiplicity of fireworks effects, is the most complex that I've ever done. So I'm really terrified and excited. Between 1968 and 1974, Chicago executed a series of increasingly complex fireworks pieces that involved performances around California and the West Coast. It was a time when I could just go out and buy fireworks, get a group of my friends, and we'd all go to the beach or to the park or to the National Forest. And my goal, looking back, I can see that what I was trying to do with these colored smokes, at the end of the fireworks, there'd be this incredible colored soft haze. I was trying to soften or feminize the atmosphere and to make a female-centered environment. morning and the Fox News comes on and it's got Saturday and Sunday with rain coming down. I'm like, how the hell did that happen? I said it was a conspiracy of the Koch brothers. Donald promised me there would be no rain. Okay, so what this is, is it, it, he's showing how he laid, Chris is showing how he laid out the mines and they're going on an angle. Instead of shooting the fireworks straight, straight up in the up, sky, they're angling I'm shooting them horizontally. So that it goes with the form. So in other words, yeah. it's gonna feel like the butterfly wings because there's nothing, there's nothing in the center right now. So it's gonna feel like the wings are going like this. I mean, this is what we've been working on for like months and months and months. Like how to make the fireworks activate the form. <clears throat> change, this was just the... I love that. that in 1974, was Chicago was commissioned by the Oakland Museum to present the monumental A Butterfly for Oakland on the shores of Lake Merritt as part of the Sculpture in the City project. By then she'd become interested in creating representational images with fireworks involving lance work, a labor-intensive process of building a framework to support the fireworks. Although the piece was wildly successful, there was no financial support to continue this work, so Judy was forced to abandon pyrotechnics. For the next four decades, Judy Chicago struggled to make a place for herself in the male-dominated art world. She wanted to be herself as a woman in her work, something she couldn't do in her early career, at least not if she wanted to be taken seriously especially in Los Angeles, which was particularly inhospitable to women artists. I was very isolated as a woman artist, and I turned to the past. The more I studied, the more I realized that even though women achieved, those achievements would be erased. 
the next decade, the next generation. I wanted to challenge that process, to end that process, to honor those achievements, and to introduce them into the society through a work of art that would symbolize our heritage so that those achievements could never be erased from history again. The butterfly has been a motif in my work from my earliest days. It was in my early graduate school paintings that my professors hated. I suppressed it. It came back. Every time it came back, I encountered rejection and resistance. I brought it back in the dinner party. OK, you walk in this way. I was trying to create images of female agency. Do you remember how we all learned in school the history of Western civilization through a series of male heroes? OK. So the dinner party recasts that with female heroes. But they're the same exact periods of history that we all learned. Each of the wings of the table represent one whole period of history. And the female figures represented on the plate and then the runners represent something about her time period. The last wing of the table is called From the American Revolution to the Women's Revolution. And slowly, the images on the plates are rising up as a metaphor for women's increasing struggle to, as I say, get the hell off the plates. <laughs> In 2012, as part of the Pacific Standard Time Performance Festival, Judy was invited to create new fireworks pieces, her first in 40 years. Working with the sixth generation fireworks family, Pyro Spectaculars, she created a butterfly for Pomona, a gigantic butterfly form that filled the football field at Pomona College and was viewed by 2,200 people. I was thinking we should set up a scaffold right at the bottom of the center line to we look can at do the that. image. All right. In A Butterfly for Brooklyn, Chicago again worked with Chris Souza of Pyro Spectaculars to present an even more elaborate undertaking, her first in the New York area. Uh, Zach sent a picture in the quadrant. Instead of going like that, it goes like that. So Rusty and I were walking it with that picture today. Yeah. And I what saw. I think the illusion is, is because, of, uh, and it happens in another There's, a dip, there's a dip in the ground. Because of the different, yeah. So I was thinking maybe we should, I should get up, like right at the bottom of the center and look out over the form and see how it reads. Boy, this is rickety. You want to dance? Stop it. What? What? See that funny thing? There's something at the top there that is not the same on those. That's the point we saw in the photo. Well, can't we push it out a little bit well, we to can... compensate? So the end where Rusty is, that needs to come, it needs to taper down that way. Yeah, that yeah. one, yeah, that's too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah right yeah, there. Yeah, that's too, that one's too high. This one's too high. Don't hit your finger. Don't hit your finger. Yeah, 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 that's good. That's, that's real, a hell of a lot better. Way better. All right, we're going to do the other side. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I believe that's the girls. These are purple?
The lights have got to have more connections. Okay. And they can't have these kind of things. They need to be smooth and consistent. We, we did that in like 20 minutes. So that's easy. And look at this. This is just hideous. <laughs> these connecting cables. That'll, they go right across the lights. All right, so let's pick a line you're gonna fire I, yeah, up. Yeah, okay. Here's a question. How many pieces of fireworks? I said thousands. It's thousands. So if we've got 15 times four is 60 that's times 10, that's 600 times four. 2,400 mines, 1,100 flares, 536 comets. I like the word thousands. 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 That's what I said, thousands. thousands. I made it up. Stop! No, 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 no. Dad, hold on. There's supposed to be a storm coming in a couple minutes. <laughs> 20 seconds. We're all looking at this storm that's swirling around us. Low clouds. We've had everything today. Rain, clouds, rainbows, sun. Rain, clouds, rainbows. to be very careful. Everybody has to be out of the way. Whoa. All right, they're ready to go. Go! OK, Chicago says go. Go! Two, one, going.
at the end of the butterfly. 12,000 people started chanting, Judy, Judy. Oh my God. Which made me intensely uncomfortable because, you know, it's not about me. What they had just witnessed was the power of art. And suddenly, the chanting of my name turned into something that did mean something to me. So if my struggle for 50 years has been to make a place in this male-dominated world of ours for the female spirit to be expressed and embraced, I reached that goal on April 26th. Wonderful film, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it for the filmmakers and everyone involved in that marvelous production, the film itself, of course, and, uh, and the butterfly uh, above all. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our panel. Uh, it may seem slightly absurd to introduce Judy Chicago at this point to you, uh, but I am going to, in fact, read this text, which is her official bio. And the reason I want to read it to you is not to let you know who Judy Chicago is because you know that very well. In fact, sometimes I think everybody in Brooklyn knows exactly who Judy Chicago is, um, but because it's a very beautiful text. Judy Chicago is an artist, writer, teacher, and humanist whose work and life are models for an enlarged definition of art, an expanded role for the artist, and women's rights to freedom of expression. 
For more than five decades, she has remained steadfast in her commitment to the power of art as a vehicle for intellectual transformation and social change and to women's rights to engage in the highest levels of art production. I think every word of that bio is worth taking to heart. Judy Chicago, please take the stage. Uh, so the last words of that uh, bio were art production, and that leads us neatly to Chris Souza, uh, who uh, indeed was one of the key figures in the production of that artwork. And I, I think that these days, production is often like film production when, when we come to art. Uh, artwork is indeed uh, a collaborative endeavor. And without people like Chris, uh, these kinds of uh, public spectacles and achievements would not be possible. Chris is in the fifth generation of a family of fireworks masters known worldwide as Pyro Spectaculars. He grew up literally in show business and is a season, seasoned producer of high profile fireworks entertainment seen by millions, including the Macy's Fourth of July Spectacular, Olympic ceremonies, Super Bowl halftime shows, international festivals, television motion pictures, music videos, and live performances. He's a fully licensed pyrotechnician with world-class training and safety, one should hope, setup techniques and show design. Chris's experience and well-rounded background serves as the foundation of the Sousa Fireworks brand exhibited in Pyro Spectacular's displays. Uh, suffice to say, even if you have not heard Chris's name before, you have certainly seen his work. Uh, Chris, please come on up. Third, we have Kate Amund, who is, uh, in addition to, as you saw, uh, heavily involved in the production, post-production of this film, editor of two Oscar-winning documentary features entitled Into the Arms of Strangers and The Long Way Home, and is the recipient of the International Documentary Association's inaugural award for outstanding achievement in editing. She also received the 2001 America Cinema Editor's Eddie Award for Into the Arms of Strangers. Her most recent film, The Case Against Eight, was an award winner at the 2014 Sundance South by Southwest Vail and River Run Film Festivals. Kate's collaboration with Judy Chicago began all the way back with The Dinner Party, and since then she has helped create many other videos about Judy's work, including Atmospheres, The Holocaust Project, and Resolutions. Kate Ammon was recently elected to the Board of Governors of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and is on the faculty of the School of Cinematic Arts at USC. She has been an advisor at Sundance Institute Documentary Editing and Storytelling Lab since June 2004. Kate, please come up. And um, finally, um, I'm going to uh, introduce Donald uh, Woodman, and I'm now go myself going to go off script because um, I would like this introduction to be from the heart. Um, Donald and I have known each other only for a couple of years, but I can truly call him a friend, and I think he is a friend to so many uh, that he has known. Uh, not least to Judy herself, and has been right there with her for so many years making all of these things possible. I think so many times in uh, the world of art, there is a partner, often by the way a woman, who's working behind the scenes making it possible for a great artist to achieve uh, what they do. And Donald does that with more grace, good humor, and elegance than anybody I have ever met. Um, he is also an artist in his own right, and in a considerable one as a photographer, um, principally. He actually has a degree in architecture, but also an MFA in photography, and he's worked with an extraordinary list of great names in photography over the years, including Ezra Stoller and Minor White, um, Dan Margulis, and also uh, was a, an assistant to the painter Agnes Martin. Um, and he has been, uh, again, as I say, right there for so many of Judy's works, including this one, Holocaust Project, many others. Um, and so it's a, a great pleasure and I think very fitting to have Donald here with us tonight as well. Please come on up, Donald. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks. Uh, so we're, we're now just going to have a, a short discussion for about 30 minutes. And then we'll, of course, take your questions uh, at the end. And we're also going to have a slideshow uh, by Chris in just a moment to give you a little bit more insight into the technical aspects of what goes into the making of a pyrotechnic display like this one. Uh, but I think it's very uh, appropriate, Judy, to give you the first word. So can you just tell us a little bit about what that was like, having 12,000 people, first of all, watch this extraordinary thing 
that you had created in the park, and then to have them sing you happy birthday at the end. Well, <laughs> well I, I think that I actually, uh, one of our goals with the film was to make viewers of the film understand what happened that night in the park and why it was so moving to me and so many other people. And I, and I think I, I uh, expressed that in the film. I'd like to talk a, a, about a couple of the challenges of the, doing the butterfly. The first challenge, well, this was like maybe the last challenge other than the rain. But you know when I got up on the scaffold and I said, Jesus, this rickety? <laughs> Friday night, we were doing a lighting test on the LED lights. And it was dark and I was tired because I'm an old lady and I've been working way too hard and I fell off the scaffold and slid open my hand and had, fortunately there were all these paramedics on the team because you know, Anyway, so I had to go to the emergency. So I had this experience in Brooklyn, going to the emergency at 8 o'clock at night, and I was there for six hours. And at 8 o'clock, nobody was there. And as the evening wore on, more and more people started coming, including, at some points, police officers. And I remember this one police officer who came in with this guy in shackles. And he was like, oh, these hurt my ankles. And I'm like, maybe you should have thought of that before you committed whatever crime it was. <laughs> anyway, so that was an experience and a challenge. But, and, oh, and then they wanted to keep me overnight. And I, because my leg was swollen up, I had to spend the whole day with my leg up with ice the next day. But I'm like, there is no way I'm staying overnight in the hospital and missing a butterfly for Brooklyn. <laughs> Okay, so that was <laughs> definitely a challenge. And, oh, and then that was why my arm was bandaged and why they had to drive me into the park and why in one of the articles they described me as frail. I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that frail. I can still like be on the treadmill for 80 minutes. Anyway, <laughs> the other big challenge, and this was really, this was a big challenge. As you saw from some of the earlier footage of of my earlier atmospheres and fireworks pieces, I worked with colored smokes. And by the time I came back to doing fireworks, they didn't make colored smokes anymore. And so when I started working with Chris, one of the real aesthetic challenges was how to bend aerial fireworks and put them in support of an image on the ground. That was really a challenge. You know what I'm talking about? Chris designing the system with the mines going sideways with the wings. That was like our effort to try and harness aerial fireworks. And the, now this is the last thing I'm going to say. You know, there's another person who works, another artist who works with fireworks. My fireworks were really for a long time not known how many years back they go. There's this Chinese artist who works with fireworks, and I have had to resist pointing out that his lasted a minute and mine last 20. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it's a competition. <laughs> no, it doesn't really have to do with competition, Glenn. It has to do with gender. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry. So, Judy, uh, before we... Uh, <laughs> Also, I think we should introduce the people yeah, who are here. Actually, actually I, I want to yeah, please. please. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you don't understand, that I was kind of upset they brought the lights up. The most important part of the film are the credits because it took an enormous amount of people, not only in terms of Chris's crew to do the fireworks, but also to do this film. And a, a number of people have come in from LA and from New Mexico who worked on the piece, and I'd like them all to stand up because it was really hard to figure out who to give what credits to because everybody worked in different ways on this thing. And I have to say this, the film that you saw tonight would not have been possible if Joan Churchill and Ellen Barker hadn't stepped in. They're friends of ours from LA. Joan is a, I'm sure, uh, 
well known in the documentary field as a uh, filmmaker and if they hadn't come on board and as I was watching, we were watching the, uh, the Academy Awards because we were trying to see Katie come in as governor <laughs> and I was thinking the only award that's given out where people come on the stage and say I couldn't have done this if so and so hadn't given me their time and volunteered. <laughs> Everybody else gets paid but this film was done by enormous amounts of people giving their time freely to uh, make this happen. So please, please stand everybody up. stand up who worked on the film so we can acknowledge And the peace. Come on, Kevin. Come on, Come on, Aaron. Come on, Helen. Helen, Helen, Helen Kearns, who actually did the editing under Katie's supervision. Joan Churchill, Alan Barker. The sound on this would not, you would not have heard the fireworks, the crowd reaction without having someone of Alan's talent working on the film. So there are a lot of people in the background that never get the credit they're due, and I really want to... And the other person who's going to get upset with me, but I'm going to ask her to stand up, because without Eric and Barbara Dawkin, this would never have happened. Barbara, please. Come on. So while we're on the subject of uh, the teamwork and the behind the scenes, uh, we now have a great opportunity to hear from Chris about the pyrotechnic aspect of this project. And Chris has a short slideshow that he's going to speak to, which will help us understand a little bit about uh, how this magic, in fact, was possible. Okay, Tim. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, really, uh, Judy had asked me uh, a month or so ago to kind of. Um, reflect on some of the challenges that uh, uh, became of uh, this, this particular project. Um, so I, I, I wrote down uh, a few of the notes, but I first wanted to you know, just take this opportunity up here to, to thank everybody at the Brooklyn Museum, um, uh, Judy and Donald, uh, also for allowing Pyro Spectaculars to participate in this, uh, what I consider a very successful celebration of uh, Judy Chicago's life work. Uh, uh, really looking back and seeing, seeing the video and whatnot, it's, it's amazing what we accomplished on April 26, 2014. So, as Donald said, everybody involved, it's uh, hands down. So, um, Can we have the lights down again yeah. just so we can see the slides? Thanks. Tim, go ahead and do the slide. So, uh, Judy and I had worked on three fireworks pieces before. We did a, a butterfly for Pomona. And uh, as Judy always says, that uh, a butterfly for Pomona was merely practice, and a butterfly for Brooklyn had to be more complex. So uh, literally, we used thousands of fireworks, <laughs> and they were all custom manufactured to really be in the scale of this, of this form. And, and the object really was to try to maintain safety and everything at the same time. Tim, go ahead and do the slide. So, uh, the f film featured some of these challenges, and, 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 and I thought it was appropriate to bring it up that one of my most fun and challenging stages of this butterfly was doing the, the wing flaps with the mines. And uh, what, what made this challenging is that we defied normal pyrotechnic usage. We didn't shoot it straight up in the air, we started doing them horizontally. So with that, you know, we had to build a special prop, um, calculate angles with x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, you know, that's something you don't normally think of in, in fireworks art, is that now we're in a three-dimensional kind of world. So, um, of course, safety being the main goal, uh, these props had to be put precisely on the grid, exactly as calculated to, to ensure that the, the distance the pyrotechnics traveled didn't go beyond the form and uh, into the crowd itself. So. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that particular stage as being really one of my most fun and, and favorite parts of a butterfly for Brooklyn. Um, Tim, go ahead and do a slide. So there's kind of a little picture there, oh, maybe under some of the, the images as it shows out, yeah. Okay, uh, the next one really of this project, Tim, go ahead and do a slide, was doing the LED lights for the veins. Now, why was this a challenge? Well, Judy and I had this idea 
And really, that's what it was. No idea other than that of how to execute it or anything else, but we really wanted to do it. So we source out some LED rope lights, and then, OK, how are we going to power them? Donald and I are pontificating ideas. And then, OK, <laughs> what colors are going to be the, are going to work best in this, in this butterfly for these veins? So you know, we, we, we really don't have any of these answers. Only thing we know is we're going to do this. Uh, um, guess what? We get lucky really get lucky. Uh, miraculously, Kevin Lederer, he's a hobby holiday home light expert. Have you seen these YouTube videos, <laughs> these people doing the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, how this is him, and he just falls into our lap out of nowhere. And uh, now, okay, we have a realistic expectation, something to formulate this plan to do these LED rope lights. Again, really no way of how we're going to execute it. So we do a power test in my warehouse in California. We do a color test in Judy and Donald's house in New Mexico. And here we go, we've got something put together. And the ultimate challenge is we couldn't put all of these pieces together until the, the night before the butterfly. That's when we get to put the robe lights out and test all those things. So this, we're like less than 24 hours away from this better work. And, uh, Furthermore, we had inclement weather all the next day to prohibit us from other testing, and of course, Julie highlighted, or Judy highlighted one of the most important features of that evening when she has a scary fall from a scaffold, a trip to an emergency room, and so on and, and so Chris forth. Chris was really pissed <laughs> off. He's like, 18 pyrotechnicians, and they let Judy fall off the scaffold? So, uh, needless to say, I, I, I really want to finish this moment here with... Uh, <laughs> for that moment of the Butterfly for Brooklyn, we were winging it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, I'll, and lastly, really, uh, to do, uh, go ahead and do a slide there, Tim. You see this, I thought, really, this That's image right here right. was the first time we'd actually seen it, and it was, to me, like, wow, that was special. So, okay. Uh, Tim, go ahead. The last challenge is really something that's obvious. We had inclement weather on show day, and what I wanted to highlight here is that we've done work as Pirate Spectaculars in New York years and years and years, so we came prepared. You always got to be prepared, so we bagged everything, we covered everything with plastic sheeting, and we, you know, Donald and I are just diligently monitoring what, whoever's smartphone had the better weather service to see what patterns are coming over Prospect Park all day long until we finally decide that we're going to do it or not. All the stakeholders in the museum are threatening us to postpone. And again, like the LEDs, we got lucky. Ugh. And we get a break. And here we go. We, we, we do it. We pull it off. And, and it was great. So, uh, And in, just in conclusion, uh, I wanted to have these thoughts and share this. But uh, Judy, as an artist, a teacher, and a friend, you challenged me to extend the line between impossible and possible with a butterfly for Brooklyn. And uh, I am forever grateful, and I will cherish the memory of the day you and Donald walked into my office in Rialto, <laughs> California. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> So let's hear it for uh, Chris and all the makers of artworks out there. That was really nice. Was really nice. Just to underline the point, you know, I think it's so easy when you go to museums or art fairs or see public sculptures, whatever the experience of art you may be having, uh, it's so easy to forget that there are people like Chris standing behind those uh, works of art. It's not just the artists. The artists obviously are crucial and um, centrally important, but it, it, it takes a village often to make uh, an artwork of this scale, magnitude, and, uh, and magic. So uh, Chris, it was great to hear those words from you. Thank you. Um, now, uh, not by no means least, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hear from Kate a little bit about the filmmaking process. Um, and we were introduced just briefly to some of the folks out in the audience who were part of it as well. Kate, can you just talk a little bit about uh, this film and perhaps some of the other projects you've done with Judy over the years? Oh, certainly. Um, well, I actually heard Judy speak for the first time in 1974 around the butterfly for Oakland because I was in San Francisco at the time. And I was determined that I was going to meet her and work with her. And in 1978, I went to uh, Los Angeles to volunteer on the dinner party 
and we've worked together ever since. And as a filmmaker, you volunteered ever since. <laughs> Be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've worked on a series, several videos um, and f short films over the years about Judy's work, and I'm sort of the keeper of the archives too, but. We're gonna to try to find a really nice vault for all those things at this point. But I'm so glad that, um, that we have all the 16 millimeter footage of the early um, atmospheres and smoke pieces that Judy did. Uh, now, this particular film, of course, it is what it is because of the spectacular cinematography of Joan Churchill, the exquisite sound by Alan Barker, and the elegant editing by Helen Kearns. And um, I was able to, you know, sort of work with this in terms of creating more of a historical uh, overview because it ended so beautifully with Happy Birthday and because this piece was uh, a celebration of, of Judy's 75th birthday, but her career in retrospective that was um, happening in Brooklyn and museums all over the place. You had a lot of shows <laughs> last year. Um, but it was so moving when the whole audience sang Happy Birthday that we thought this also could be a, a film where we could do a little bit of a look backwards at Judy's career, a little overview, and a sense of, of what that moment culminated for her. And so I think that's where I sort of came in was to to bring in the background um, and, and give it a historical perspective. But the actual piece, um, filming the, uh, the fireworks, I think you all can talk about um, in much more detail than, than I can. Well, well I, th I think Katie hates <coughs> being a bit modest about it because inevitably I pick up the telephone and I call her and I say, listen, there's this video or this film we need to do, and I need your help. And uh, she brings in an extraordinary team of people to work on it. As I said, everybody volunteering. So I think you're being a bit modest about <laughs> your role in the whole thing. She can, she, because of the long history, she gives an incredible perspective to what we do. And because of her ability in filmmaking and editing, she can help uh, craft the storyline, which otherwise wouldn't happen. One of the things that's very striking about the film to me is that it does have a narrative arc, and it also has a lot of tension in it, which I think is a lot, a lot of that is because of the weather, and it's sort of will it happen or won't it, you kind of knew the ending. But, it's, <laughs> but, it, but it does have this, this, kind of, um, this kind of conflict of mm -hmm. you know, wh what's going to happen. Uh, do you feel like that was something you tried to bring out in shaping the film, that sense oh. of a storyline? Was that intentional? Well, I wish Helen would talk about that. Well, why don't we can, <laughs> Helen, there's, oh. a, there's, a yeah, there's a microphone right over there. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you... <laughs> Let's hear from the editor, Helen. Helen was the editor, Helen Kearns. presented itself, it was, it was very clear kind of from the beginning. Um, the things that stood out to me really were Judy and Donald as our stars. The, their relationship was like really very appealing to me and they, they just make such a great team that that's something I kind of wanted to highlight. And you know, the weather thing, that was, that was <laughs> what was you know, looming over from the very beginning, from the first five minutes of footage that I was watching, you know. So it was pretty clear from the very beginning that that was kind of, you know, the, the source of tension that was going on. I don't know who wants to take this on from the film team, but um, I, I would be curious to, to hear someone talk about the moments in the film where you actually let Judy seem like a quite strict taskmaster, because there's a couple of really interesting moments where I think there's one moment, Donald, where you, you, you try to start dancing a minuet on top of a scaffold. With <laughs> I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the fall. And Judy said, stop it. Don't. And then there's another moment where, Judy, you, you sort of march around the field saying, that's hideous, this is wrong, look at those wires, what are you people doing? And it, I thought it was very, um, I thought it was great that that was in the film, partly because it gives the sense of the reality and the pressure 
uh, of the project, mm -hmm. but also um, because it does give you this, uh, I don't know, this feeling of, of insight into the uh, behind the scenes process and it's a r moment of kind of human humanity. So could you talk right. a little bit about well, Why don't we get Joan yeah. Churchill to Just talk Joan, about Joan that? Joan Capture. She filmed that. Right. She filmed can, I, can I interject before Joan kind of yeah. does the filming side, but from the practical side of this, this was for us hilarious too. We literally, as I described, didn't have very many opportunities to set these LED lights up. We just put them out minutes before Judy shows up, and that's when she's like, ah! We had no time to dress it. I mean, we didn't get it Judy-proof at all before she showed up, so it was, I thought it was kind of hilarious, too. So, so it was great that it made hideous. the film. It's hideous. Yeah. So there, there's weatherproofing and there's yeah. Judy-proofing, which is more difficult. Uh, you know, can we hear from Joan Churchill? This is Joan Churchill. Um, I, we, we were just following Judy around, and this is how Judy is. And um, <laughs> as, as a filmmaker, I felt, you know, we had gone home. Alan Barker and I had left when Judy fell off the platform. We weren't there. And so I felt, you know, it was a huge loss not to have captured this in the film. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like it was, it was my failure um, oh. not to have been there. Uh, for that moment, because I, I think somehow it would have added to this this feeling of impending doom, which you know we had the weather. I mean, it was incredible. It it rained up to ten minutes before the they took the plastic off, and then of course we didn't know if anything was going to to work, you know, because obviously some of it it was windy and you know raining and. We didn't know if it was going to work. And then, literally, we had that half an hour window for the butterfly to take flight, and then, and then it poured. And we just <laughs> felt it was, as, as you say, a miracle. But You know, uh, New Yorkers are really tough. You saw all those people <laughs> coming out with umbrellas and stuff like that. But no matter how tough New Yorkers are, the deluge that came down 10 minutes after the peace ended, nobody could have withstood. And I'm like, oh my God, that would have been the most expensive rainstorm on the face of the earth. That, I mean, oh my God, it was so fortunate. It was very amusing the next day in the New York Times, they said, among Judy Chicago's other accomplishments, she seems to have an ability to control the weather. I'm like, well, yeah, I like, I really had something to do with it. Right? So um, yeah. we've been talking about. I would like to. I would like to add that, uh, in response to your question, that this is a large-scale artwork that requires a strong leader. And if the leader had been a man, that question might not have been asked. Right. Absolutely, Ellen. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, thank Great you. Judy is a strong leader, don't, don't you forget. I mean, that. I'm tough. Yeah. I am tough. You but are. I wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't been tough. My God. But Impossible. It, all, it also sets the bar high for everybody to work, to work to. And I know we've been working with Chris now for, uh, uh, like you said, on three different pieces. And so, you know, each one was more complex and more complicated. And as he said, it's tough sometimes to reach that bar, but if you don't set, if Judy hadn't mm -hmm. set it that high, you yeah. wouldn't have tried to reach it. Yeah. Because, you know, I have a different feeling about that. I feel like it's really a positive thing to ask a lot from people because it gives them the opportunity to go beyond themselves. And that's what I believe art is, is being in the service of something bigger than us so that we can go beyond ourselves that line between the possible and the impossible, or what seemed impossible before, yeah. and art does often get you over that line. Mm -hmm. It shows you another space that you could be in. Mm -hmm. um, just on that point, Judy, I did want to talk a little bit more about the art part of yeah. Butterfly for Brooklyn, because we've been talking a lot about the practicalities, and they are absolutely fa fascinating. I think we all here share the value of wanting to acknowledge everybody who uh, puts their all into the making of something like this. Uh, but could, could you talk a little bit about the ideas behind the butterfly for Brooklyn, um, both the idea of creating a public so-called spectacle, a public artwork like this, and also maybe a little bit more about pyrotechnics as an art medium? As you said, you're one of the few artists, and perhaps the first, um, certainly the first I know of, yeah, and then to we'll get, And then we'll let people in the audience ask questions. And then we'll ask, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll let, what, 
the audience join in, but can you say just a little bit about what the, the kind of um, ideas that led you to these kinds of works were in the first place? Well, you know, I started in, at the end of the 1960s when, as I said in the film, I, I had a group of friends, we just went out and everybody did, everybody worked. I mean, everybody either lit flares or brought food or took pictures. I mean, it was a very different time. And I mean, imagine I did a smoke piece in the National Forest. <laughs> No, I mean, Mount no, per yeah, Mount Baldy, right, yeah, uh -huh. I mean, those were the days where you didn't have to ask permission, no permits, nothing. And at that time, I, I was interested, I mean, somebody, I was talking about this with somebody else the other day, you know, in retrospect, you can see a lot uh, in terms of aesthetic impulses that you might not understand at the time. You know, it was a period of time where I, was struggling really hard in the macho LA art scene in the 60s, where I couldn't be myself as a woman. There was no possibility of discussing issues of gender. And um, I, I had been working on color systems and how to create like emotion through color. And I was doing all of these kind of abstract, formal works because I had excised any hint of gender from my work in order to be taken seriously in the art scene. And I had these color systems where I would lay out color and I had done this series of domes, plastic domes, in, in which the color would appear at different levels inside the domes. And I, ha I was already working collaboratively. I was doing artist events. I did this event with two other artists in Pasadena on the night of the Rose Bowl, because my studio fronted the Rose Bowl. And I laid on the street, I laid uh, smoke uh, machines. And I designed a color wheel, and quite by accident, the color wheel was going and the smoke was rising and there were all these colored smokes in the air. And it was like the color inside my domes had been liberated from their formal container. And this was right at the same time as I was getting ready to make this really radical change in my art making, go to Fresno, start the first feminist art program, try to figure out how to create a feminist art practice, how to create work that was openly female-centered. And so the, the, the fireworks pieces were my, I think, a kind of act of liberation that was ahead of my evolution at that point as an artist. So I did all these smoke pieces all over Southern California. And then when I was invited in 1974 to do uh, this piece for the Oakland Museum, by then, I had decided to try and actually create an image with fireworks. I used smoke and road flares and magnesium flares and um, uh, Roman candles, okay? But the technology was entirely different. And then I had to stop for a variety of reasons. And now that technique of creating, they, they mentioned it in the film, but that technique of creating an image with fireworks used to be used a lot, like in Fourth of July shows where they made American flags and stuff like that, but it's not used hardly at all anymore. You know, it's all given away to these aerial fireworks. So when I came back to it, as I said, I was having to learn a whole new language. This technique of, of building an image is called lance work, very labor intensive. And even though the technology of fireworks had changed dramatically between 1974 and 2012, lance work hadn't changed at all. In fact, it was hardly used. Chris knew how to do it because of the tradition of their family. So I came to him with the idea of picking, because I wanted to pick up where I left off and move forward. And so I did a butterfly for, we did a butterfly for Pomona and Tim Nye, um, sponsored a piece on the back of his building for the show I did there in LA and I did um, a, a series of petal forms that I learned a lot from you know in terms of the different techniques and then thanks to Eric and Barbara and the Brooklyn Museum I, I, we had the opportunity to really work at the kind of scale I had always wanted to work at in fireworks 
and, but it was going to be, uh, um, you know, a challenge to incorporate even more it, techniques. And also, as Chris said, by that time he understood that we were trying to create an image with fireworks, which was new for him too. And you know, that's when he came up with this idea of the mines angling, the mines building a technology that could do that. Mm. So, would you say that because the, I was struck in the film about uh, your comment that the butterfly image had always been there in your painting? Oh yeah, it came and went from early yeah. on. So th there's something interesting there about the image itself. But I, I also wanted to ask you about the concept of painting in relation to the butterfly for Brooklyn because this idea of the color being liberated, the smoke being liberated out of the sculpture. Or the, painting, or out, painting out, of, exactly. out of a formal structure, so, yeah. So do you feel that this is continuous with your practice as a painter and image maker? Well, actually, I think myself, I've gone back, first of all, I, I got an MA in, before they had MFAs, in both painting and sculpture. So I've always gone back and forth between painting and sculpture, and I myself think my best work is when there's a fusion of that, like in the dinner party, mm -hmm. in the fireworks. I think that's where my real talent lies, is in fusing painting and sculpture. I just haven't had a lot of opportunities to do it. Mm. OK. OK, I, I think um, that's a good note to um, turn to the audience. Uh, I'm sure there must be some questions out there, both from those who were there uh, last year at, at the event and also those who weren't. So um, anybody uh, with questions, and please come to the microphone. Partly because we are um, we are live streaming this, so this way people at home will also be able to hear the question. Thanks. Uh, so it's a pleasure, and I want to uh, express first of all, uh, as a as an art student, uh, uh, many years ago, uh, not that many years ago, but en enough time has passed uh, that it's. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a surprise and a, and a pleasure to be uh, uh, present here tonight uh, uh, with regards to uh, Judy Chicago and what's, what's uh, been accomplished uh, with regards to uh, taking art to another level. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Judy and Chris uh, if there are any more projects uh, in the works that might uh, possibly involve uh, helping kids in the inner city, maybe getting them to participate in the, uh, in the whole thing and uh, empowering kids in, in uh, inner city communities. Okay, thank you. Well, I mean, even though I wish that uh, we would be more op offered opportunities to do more work, that hasn't happened. What's your name, by the way? What do you do? <laughs> Have you ever had a chance to work with uh, kids as part of your production teams, Judy? With who? Kids. With kids, with children. With children? Um, fireworks, possibly not the obvious No, uh, fireworks are... <laughs> Statutory reasons why... Yeah, right, I mean, are you, you kidding? We could well, you know... Uh, uh, n no, I Because you, you've often worked with non-artists if I can put it that way. In other words, people without formal art training you yeah. brought them into the art making experience. But I have been concerned about the, edu the education and the arts of children. And you know, I, I worked with uh, K through 12 art educators to develop a dinner party curriculum because it was of great concern to me that so many art teachers are women and they teach so little about women in schools mm -hmm. and in art programs. But I mean, my focus has really been on art making, yeah, yeah. making images. This might be a moment to plug your new book, Judy, because uh, oh, institutional <laughs> time. Yeah, institutional time. Yeah, my last yeah. book. I've published fourteen books. This is my public, my longtime publicist who was here, who I worked with since he was a baby publicist, and like, <laughs> oh, how long ago? Twenty-five years ago? Thirty years ago? Uh, 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 Anyway, my last book was uh, called Institutional Time, and it, it's a critique of studio art education, and um, w which I am very critical of. Mm, you are. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Other questions. Yes. Who are you? Um, my name's Rachel, 
And, um, you know, we've danced around it, but could you be explicit and talk about what made this a piece of feminist art? The butterfly, <laughs> first of all, is an ancient symbol of the goddess and of the feminine. So in and of itself, the symbol of the butterfly, using the butterfly image and the effort over and over again in my work to build an imagery based on the butterfly. What is the butterfly? It's an image of agency because it can fly, it can soar, and we women have very few images of agency that we see in our museums. And that has been my lifelong goal, is to bring images of the feminine into the culture in a way that is honored in the same way that men's imagery is. Also, I want to add to that, also the process of creating this work, the, the collaborative process, the acknowledging of everybody who's involved, of not jumping out in front of the camera and saying, all those people in the background, they, they mean nothing, they have nothing to do with what I'm creating. And if you look at a lot of YouTube videos of other artists at work, you will see that. It's a, it's a whole different way of working. And it's a feminist way and of working. And it's a feminist way, yes. And it, it's inclusive, it's not, a gender-based idea. It's a value-based idea, and it allows a team of men and women and everybody to contribute and reach to their highest ability to make something happen. And I think that's something that, sh doesn't, that shouldn't be overlooked. And the other thing feminist about it is that one of the discussions that Donald and I had with Barbara and Eric Dopkin early on was whether or not a woman artist working at the same level of aspiration as male artists have worked historically could get the same level of funding. I, I had to stop in 1974 because I couldn't. And Barbara had her own challenges in trying to find enough funding and ultimately she and Eric had to provide all of it, almost all of it because they were not pre prepared for the answer to be no. And so they get a lot of credit for that. Yeah. It is rare to have that uh, kind of patronage and also as Elizabeth Sackler is teaching us to say matronage. Yes. Um, and this is a very interesting, just parenthetically, a very interesting um, initiative that Elizabeth here at the Brooklyn Museum is spearheading to try to take the word matron, which sounds to us, probably all of you, uh, have this immediate association with being matronly as somehow, I don't know, um, you know, unfashionable or um, otherwise it's, it's a pejorative term. And uh, Elizabeth is making the great point that the word matron should have just as positive a connotation as the word patron. And that's another lurking gender bias in our language that she's trying to address, which I think is great. How about one more? Can I, can one I uh, oh, also yeah, comment too? This is a little less abstract, but as Judy mentioned, her early works, it was, it was sort of came to a, a crossroads or an ending based on gendered biases. But when she re regrouped with me, one of the great things about us is that uh, my mother is a pyrotechnician. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of uh, mm -hmm. is what kindled our spine. And my mother was like one of the first female pyrotechnicians in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my understanding that the biases of, of male versus female didn't, just didn't exist in what I do as an art form in fireworks. And I think that's what really helps even these butterfly projects and the deflowering just really be a piece of feminist art as well as, as you know, a fireworks art. So um, there's, there's a lot of less abstract pieces to this uh, as well as from uh, just having uh, in the butterfly for Pomona, we had on 90% female crew, and, and even here in Brooklyn, it was a, you know, a, a large portion of, of female pyrotechnicians mm -hmm. to, to pull and this off. And there were no so. female pyrotechnicians when I was first doing fireworks. Actually, when we walked into Kirsten's <coughs> office, Judy was telling the story of her history, because you, you were trying to become a, pyrotechnic. a pyrotechnician, and she got har sexually harassed out of the business. Mm -hmm. Chris smiled and said, oh, I think I know who that was. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, how about one more question? Yeah, one more question over here. Anybody else? Yes, yes. hi, I'm Zeus. And I want to thank you very much for all you've done to bring your work to Brooklyn. And um, I want to ask you, when you were first emerging as an artist, like what did it take and who were the, the key players in your emergence as an artist? And I also wanted to point out that I'm particularly and deeply moved by how you uh, interrupt and contradict uh, sexism in your space. I love that about you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh uh, I started drawing when I was three, and I started going to art school when I was five, and I always wanted to be an artist from the time I was a child. It, and um, I was exceedingly fortunate because I was raised in a family that believed in equal rights for women. That's like the good news. The bad news is they didn't tell me the rest of the world didn't share that opinion. <laughs> so it was kind of a shock when I went to college. And I used to raise my hand to ask a question and the professor wouldn't call on me. So I was like waving my hand and waving. <laughs> but anyway, I also was very, very fortunate because my father worked at night and my mother worked in the daytime. And my father was very, my father was home when I woke up from my afternoon naps. My father was the labor organizer and a Marxist and a wonderful man. And um, he trained me in logic, he trained me in values. Uh, he, I, I grew up in an integrated household and my father used to play this game with me. Uh, we had a housekeeper named Ori Blue who was African American and we, he used to play this game. We're walking down the street with Ori Blue and then we run into Norman Black and then we see Harriet Orange. And what he was teaching me was that color and people that you can't judge people based on color, which was reinforced by my household. But when I was 13, probably the most important thing in my life happened to me. My father died. And this was at the height of McCarthyism. So I was going to school and seeing these things called the weekly readers, which were these poor, <laughs> and they would have all these blonde, blue-eyed, American soldiers bayoneting big, horrible, bloated communists. And I was being confronted with the idea that my father was a terrible person from the world's point of view. And at 13, I had to decide whether I would believe the world or I would believe my own experience. And that, that challenge helped me a lot as I grew up and encountered all this sexism and racism and resistance because I had learned to trust my own experience. And without that, I don't, I don't, I don't really think I could have survived. Thank you very much. This was the first time anybody saw the film. It was a great pleasure to us to share it with you. Thank you so much, Zeus. Uh, can we have a hand for this wonderful <laughs> and articulate supporter of Judy's work? Um, I just want to uh, leave you, uh, first of all, with a quick announcement just to say that this is actually just part one of Judy Chicago right. on Fire. So tomorrow night at MAD, at the Museum of Arts and Design in Columbus Circle, we'll be having the second part. And we're going to have a very interesting evening in which we'll be seeing some of the archival films, which Kate alluded to, 
and you saw it excerpted in, in the film tonight, that shows some of uh, Judy's uh, fireworks, uh, principally from the 70s. And so Judy will um, also be in dialogue tomorrow with Elisa Author of Mad Museum, who is an important feminist art historian in her own right. Uh, that, uh, that event actually is sold out, um, I'm happy to say, um, but I hope that some of you will be able to, to join us then. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's all the announcements, unless anybody on the panel has one. Nope. Okay. Um, so, so it just leaves me to, uh, yes, is there something about, sorry? I don't, I don't think we're streaming tomorrow night, unfortunately, but, um, but uh, we will try to uh, yeah, you, put if, social if you, media. If anybody it. wants to see it, you can go to uh, throughtheflower.org. Yeah. To our website, it's on there. And, and you, you might um, people don't always show up, so. Yeah, you, you might if if you're absolutely um, intensely interested, pl please come and we might be able to get you in on the door. Um, so um, so it just leaves me to thank our wonderful panel. Uh, thank you all so much for your comments tonight. Thank you. And um, I, I just want to leave you with one thought before offering Judy the uh, opportunity to have the last word, which I think would be the most appropriate thing. But I, I just want to say that um, for all of the achievements of Judy and all the people that have supported her, this is certainly not a, um, this is not a done deal. We do not have gender equality in the art world by any stretch of the imagination, by any statistical analysis. We still have a vastly lopsided um, art world that, that we inhabit, despite people like Elizabeth Sackler, Robert Dobkin, uh, making it possible for people like Judy to achieve what they do. So let's um, simultaneously have in our hearts that we are thanking Judy for everything that she's accomplished, but also hope that there are many Judy Chicagos out there uh, to come who will, who will continue her uh, struggle. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks, thanks everyone very much. Have a, have a great night.